You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 107 of the Common Descent Podcast. What's on the docket today? Tusks. Tusks. Tuskers. Featuring special guest Kevin Smith. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> uh, we wish. <laughs> we wish. Just uh, that would very quickly veer off of paleontological <laughs> topics and it would, we'd just be talking about superheroes. Yep. Which I wouldn't complain about. But <laughs> tusks it, the teeth, like tusks elephants. The, the special teeth that walruses, so many animals have. They sure do. And we call these animals tuskers, which I always knew was a nickname for them. But hmm. I found multiple a paper that referred to them as tuskers. So evidently it's like official, which makes me very happy. That's cool. So tusked animals come in many varieties. The tusks, they're specialized teeth that stick out of their mouth usually. Mm-hmm. Also come in a wide variety, used for different purposes, formed in different ways, in different shapes, from different teeth. <laughs> Tusks are super common and weird and often misunderstood. There's, we're still learning a lot about them. So in this episode, we're going to look at what is a tusk? What makes a tusk a tusk instead of just a tooth? Right. You know, why do we distinguish it? Who has them? Of course, not all of them, but... What's some of the variety? What what kind of tusks do we see and have have been evolved? And then what's some of the trends? You know, why do things grow tusks? What are some of the evolutionary patterns we tend to see with things that have tusks? And then what's some of the ways that they're important to us people? Right. Both as research things and as... Just things. Things <laughs> as a resource. <laughs> Yeah, this episode is sort of a spin-off of episode 88 when mm-hmm. we talked about teeth. And indeed, I think it was at the end of that episode uh, where Oh, yes, it was. We pitched the idea of, "Hey, we'll do an episode about tusks if people want it." And they wanted it. Who wanted it? <laughs> we had a few requests for this from Ari, Lydia, and Nemo. So, thanks for the request, everyone. This was a fun one to do notes on. I'm ready to hear all about tusks. Now, before we get into the episode, We have some announcements. Just a few. Just a few. Very few. As usual, one of our announcements includes the fact that we have a Patreon. We do. We get money from people who support us. And that support helps us keep the podcast running top to bottom these days, which is amazing. And if you support us at a certain level, we like to shout your name out here on the podcast to thank you and welcome you. And today, I would like to shout out June. Hello, June. Welcome. Thank you so much for your support. Thanks to June, and thanks to everyone who supports us now or has in the past, on pa- or will in the future. Yes, yeah, present, future, and past patrons, we thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> Ad infinitum. Of course, until the end of time, uh, patrons get all sorts of bonus goodies. Uh, we do bonus mm-hmm. news episodes. Uh, we have director's notes for yep, yep, each. Yep. Uh, so different levels of patrons get different cool things. Absolutely. And that's most of our announcements. Real short today. Yeah, we, we, we have things on the docket. We have things in the planning oh, phase. Oh, there's going to be announcements. But that they're enough way off that you don't get to hear about them yet. Not just yet, right? We're going to go right into the news. And indeed, it is time for the news. Well, let's talk about news. Every episode, we gather up recent news articles, research, from the scientific fields of geology, paleontology, biology, evolutionary sciences, things that interest and fit with the podcast theme and we share them all with you to keep us up to date and to keep you up to date and to keep us up to date first david my first bit of news today is about squamates the best of the reptiles (laughs) specifically mosasaurs i mean those are the best of the squamates that's not true but they are (laughs) they are way up there (laughs) they're like top two mosasaurs are third if anything the big uh, aqua- often big aquatic lizards of the Cretaceous period, which we talked about extensively in episode 51. This is a paper that identifies a new type of mosasaur mm-hmm. that seems to have been doing things that no other mosasaurs are known to have done. Walking. Based on its, <laughs> <laughs> based on its legs. Just these big honking legs. No, based on its teeth. 
Uh, indeed, we do, uh, it doesn't sound like they have enough of the specimen to know whether or not it was capable of walking on land. long dancer's legs. Just long legs. If it did, it would be the only mosasaur known to do that. So uh, Parsimony says, no, it was not a walking mosasaur. Marine lizards. <laughs> This is research by Nicholas Longrich et al. in the journal Cretaceous Research. And in our blog, hey, every episode we have a blog with bonus stuff, we will link to an article in Science News by Jake Bueller. Mosasaurs, uh, the, the lizards who wanted to be whales, were had this huge amount of diversity, this big radiation of forms and lifestyles in the middle to late Cretaceous. They came in a range of sizes from rather small to some of the largest animals that have ever lived. Ridiculously big. Diets, ecological niches. They lived all over the world. Uh, most mosasaurs, when it comes to teeth, had conical piercing teeth. Not too different from like a crocodilian. Yeah, a little more curved than a crocs, but really pretty pretty standard croc tooth. Or a sea lion or mm -hmm. a dolphin. Mm -hmm. You know, standard, I swim in the ocean and I catch and eat things okay. teeth. This is good for grabbing things that are slippery. Other mosasaurs, there's been a number that have been found to have had rock-shaped crushing teeth. Yeah. They're broader, flatter for crushing hard stuff, shells and things. This new study describes a chunk of mosasaur jaw with unusual teeth. The specimen comes from the latest Cretaceous, so around 66 million years ago or so, of Morocco in North Africa, from a phosphate mine, part of a jaw of a mosasaur that, given the size of the jaw, the whole animal probably would have been maybe a little over a meter long, Aww. according to the writing here, which is... Rather small for a mosasaur. Yeah, he's itty baby. A little baby, little baby mosasaur. But the thing that stands out is its teeth. The teeth of this mosasaur are relatively short, flat side to side, so like blades, kind of square shaped, and hooked. So I'm going to show Will a picture oh. from the article. And if you go to the blog post, you can click on the link under the news and see the picture of these teeth. Yeah, they're almost trapezoidal. They're almost trapezoidal or square-shaped with a little hooked point off the back. And they're really closely spaced so that they form kind of a saw blade mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the teeth. And indeed, uh, this jaw morphology is strange enough that the authors were able to identify it as a new genus and species. And they named it Xenodens calminicari, which means, the first part means strange teeth. Hmm. And the species name apparently uh, comes from Arabic words, meaning like a saw blade. Oh, cool. Not only is this cool because it's new, but also having teeth different from all other mosasaurs suggests you were doing something that no other mosasaurs were doing. And in fact, they point out in the paper, not only is this unique among mosasaurs, there are no other squamates, mm -hmm. so lizards and snakes with teeth like this, and indeed there are no other tetrapods. Yeah. Right. Land-dwelling vertebrates with teeth like this. Like, no mammals, no amphibians, no other reptiles. The authors uh, suggest that the closest thing they could come up with uh, might be dogfish sharks. Yep, that's th that's what they looked like to me when you showed it to me. It's yeah. very shark-esque. Like this sort of saw blade. Mm -hmm. Where uh, the teeth are lining teeth. up into one blade, not each yep. of them a little blade. They, they, they don't seem like they're acting individually. Mm -hmm. that they seem is. like they're forming a battery. Yes. Sort of like we talked about uh, in episode 87 with ceratopsians, the horned dinosaurs. It's a bunch of teeth basically functioning as a unit. Mm -hmm. Dogfish sharks, the authors explain, uh, are use those teeth to slice chunks of flesh out of food. Mm -hmm. So real good for just slicing out a chunk. And they scavenge and they eat all sorts of things, fish to anemones. So the authors suggest maybe these little mosasaurs were doing something very similarly. Yes. Either for prey or for scavenging, that they had this sort of, uh, this mouth built for just taking a quick slice. Uh, not, I don't want to say cookie cutter. I was going to say cookie cutting mosasaur. shark. <laughs> there is a cookie cutter shark, which is has its own weird... Well, and it, it, it's doing that thing, but it's taken it to the nth degree. Like, cookie cutters right. effectively have one giant tooth in rows. Like, their right. teeth, I don't know that they have actually fused, but they're pretty close to being fused into a single, actual right. single cutting surface. And this isn't quite like that. 
But it is a similar concept of just, I want to just shwink, slice a piece off. That made, I, I love the idea of big mosasaurs being pestered by these itty bitty meter long mosasaurs just coming in and then swimming away. <laughs> just bite a chunk out of your fin. Yeah. Ah. Now, uh, in the science news article, uh, they also reached out to another researcher not involved with the study for outside comments. In this case, Paulina Jimenez Huidobro, who cautions comparison with sharks because while the teeth are similar, they make the point that shark jaws and mosasaur jaws function very differently. This is very true. Like, mosasaurs bite like lizards, which is basically the way we bite. And then sharks bite like sharks. Sharks bite like sharks. <laughs> Their jaws work very differently. Go back to episode 48, learn about sharks. It's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, the mosasaur, you're saying it hasn't evolved a rotating flip forward mouth? No, it doesn't <laughs> stick its jaws forward <laughs> to grab. Yeah, exactly. So it may not be a one-to-one comparison. It's a very good point. Mm-hmm. Uh, similar teeth don't mean everything else is similar. But regardless of what it's actually doing, it does imply that there's more to mosasaur diversity than we thought. They point out in the paper that based on the shape of the teeth and the way they meet with the jaw, the closest similar mosasaur, so possibly a relative, is a mosasaur called Carinodens, which is a a shell chomper. Oh. So this appears to be part of a diverse group of mosasaurs within the whole of mosasaurs which uh, as we can see from this specimen were still experimenting with all sorts of cool lifestyle diversity right up to the end of the cretaceous period yeah that they were still partitioning those niches yeah in cool weird ways and they were still diverse mm-hmm. you know it, it, we've talked about this many times with the end cretaceous mass extinction episode five about was this an extinction that was dropped into a flourishing world mm-hmm. or were there sort of lead ups to it? And that this is one of those cases where it seems, no, mosasaurs were diverse and widespread and doing all sorts of exciting evolutionary things and then went extinct. Yes. Very interesting. I, I really would love to see a, a more complete specimen. Yes. Because I just to see like the shape of the full mouth and jaw and like yeah, gotta find those legs and you gotta find those legs to <laughs> see what it was chasing down. It was it was see what how it was swinging through the trees. <laughs> yes, <laughs> leaping upon sauropod necks and just <laughs> shink. Very neat. Well, speaking of things with legs and how they oh, might have moved, what a what a segue. <laughs> this study is about dinosaur locomotion. It was a attempt to look at dinosaur relatives in a new way to get maybe potentially some insights into how they maybe potentially might have walked. I'm I'm so excited <laughs> by the potential. <laughs> this research is by Armida Minofside et al. in PNAS, and the article we'll be linking is by Sarah Wells in Inverse. So this study is attempting to get insight into the biomechanical movements of walking, which is a a common issue with trying to interpret extinct animals in general, but dinosaurs who are not a lot like things we have today. So we don't have a one-to-one for what a sauropod might have moved like or a a theropod, a a, meat-eating dinosaur, and has often been difficult to study because even when we try to use things like robots or simulations those can only get us so close and we could very well be introducing our own biases into how we think they move right there's a lot we don't know and when there's one example they gave was when the research team strapped a stick to a chicken rump Mm -hmm. and to give it a tail to give it a tail to see if it walked more like a dinosaur and the many of the reports were and it did according to how we assume Right. A dinosaur walks. Like, <laughs> we don't actually know that it did start at walking more like a dinosaur. It walked more the way we've pictured dinosaurs walking. So is that support or is that coincidental? Right. Is that how or a is chicken that... walks when you strap a tail to it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what we've done. This research uses XROM, X-ray reconstruction of moving morphology. It's a new 3D imaging technology that they are using to hopefully give them a a view 
into the mo- uh, a more detailed view into the movements of dinosaur relatives. Cool. So what they did is they took X-ray videos of alligators and guinea fowl, a type of bird, walking and having their limbs manipulated, so moved around mm-hmm. in various ways. They also took CT scans of the whole animal's skeleton, and they transferred both data sets to XROM for its 3D reconstruction. In total, it analyzed close to 600,000 joint poses. Wow. So looking at the different positions the joints can be in, and what this allowed them to do was to map, was to create joint mobility maps. Maps of how mobile these two animals' joints are and can be. Right. Now they can compare a bird and an alligator's mobility maps to see where there is overlap. The two existing members of archosaurs, where do they overlap? Because if we find overlap, that may be a archosaur overlap. Right, something ancestral. Which would therefore mean it could very likely be true for dinosaurs as well. Or at least close to true. Very cool approach. It's I, I find it so fascinating. They uncovered two important similarities between these animals and their mobility, their joints. First, both appeared to favor a narrow center of mobility, a limited range, which may mean that dinosaurs were also fairly limited to these ranges. You know, so they weren't going crazy with their limb mobility, right? as far as I understand it. intuitively makes sense yep. that you would stick to what works the best. Mm-hmm. Like we, when we're moving around, we're usually not flailing in all the ways we can move. Yeah. We're sticking, we all walk basically the same way because that's what works. Well, and I also assume that it means that the the guinea fowl and the alligator aren't moving their legs around like a cat does. Right. And stretching its leg up over the back of its head to clean itself. Like, they, they move in fairly limited ways for most of the time and may have a just generally more limited range of movement. Gotcha. If I was interpreting the way they were describing mobility maps, Mm -hmm. this is all new. The other was that both showed a pattern of abduction during movement and weight-bearing stances to say movement away from the body's midline. So not directly in line with the body while moving, but slightly out from that. Okay. Which, as the paper put it, could suggest that dinosaurs, when walking, walk a little duck-footed. That their feet weren't perfectly under them like many of us mammals but a little more out a little more sprawled a little more sprawled or maybe that their legs moved out during step you know that it wasn't Mm -hmm. it wasn't this perfect straight line okay uh this is all very new and and early yeah yeah research for it so i'm sure there's lots more that they can look into and in fact they said some of the next things they want to do is look at forelimb movement because this was all focused on the hind limbs for the most part. Gotcha. They want to start looking at the forelimbs and apply this to other groups, like see how pterosaurs might have been able to move their joints by comparing the the data sets and get an idea for how could those joints move during flight. Mm-hmm. Stuff like that. So th- this is fairly groundbreaking, and I'm sure we'll have a lot said about it since it is so such new technology. Interesting. I, I, I assume that the logical future is to do this with all sorts of animals mm-hmm. because it occurs to me that it'd be really cool to see this for, you know, elephants, mm-hmm. which are another classic comparison with dinosaurs, especially things like sauropods and ceratopsians for giant four legged creatures. Yeah, for heavy weight bearing animals. And see if, is there sort of a middle point or a melding of elephant movement and alligator movement Mm -hmm. or something like that that might approximate what dinosaurs were doing well and i i'd also love them to look into other members of these two groups like i i don't know a lot about guinea fowl Mm -hmm. uh, but my understanding is they are not too dissimilar from their movements of like chickens and like other fowl right but like what about a roadrunner you know, what about an ostrich? Yeah. Or what, what about, about a crocodile? What about crocodiles who can gallop while alligators don't show galloping behavior? Yeah. Like, would a freshwater crocodile or a Cuban crocodile show yeah. way different movement while it's chasing something? I'd also be interested to see people start combining this line of data with, you know, muscle mm-hmm. evidence and, and muscle reconstruction 
to see how much of this movement we're seeing from gators and birds is even possible yeah. in dinosaur. Like, where is the overlap that all of the different lines of data are suggesting? I think this is exciting because it's one more mm-hmm, mm-hmm. line of evidence we can use to interpret that uh, that answer, that, that hopefully a near true answer of how dinosaurs moved. Yes. Well, that's exciting. Well, speaking of research investigating locomotion in animals, my second bit of news is about squamates, the best of the reptiles. And Specifically, we, we've heard it before. Snakes. <laughs> uh, in particular, this is research that is exploring what is different physically about snakes who use sidewinding. Oh, yes, I saw this to title. move. This is research by Jennifer Reeser et al., also in the journal PNAS, and we will link to an article in Cosmos by Deborah Davis. Snakes, as I'm sure we've discussed before, we did a whole episode, episode three about snakes, have several different ways that they can move. The most famous and common of which is called lateral undulation, Mm -hmm. which is the slithering in an S-shape kind of motion. That motion, what they're doing when they're doing that sine wave slither is pushing against the ground as they move. Yeah, each each outside bend of the curve is finding something to anchor itself and push the body forward. Right. Uh, one way that I've seen it described is if you imagined uh, it making a jump on one foot off to the side, side to side, and each time pushing yourself a little bit forward with your foot, Mm -hmm. you'd end up sort of moving forward in this diagonal leaping motion. That's kind of what they're doing. Each loop side to side is pushing off of their substrate, right? The floor, or if they're up against something, or if they're on a tree. That's what I was going to say is uh, the times I've gotten to see videos of them climbing and it's still a very S-shape motion is the clearest because you can watch them find the purchase and actually see them put their weight on this new little knot in the tree. Yes. And then they start moving forward again. On the ground, it's just much more subtle because gravity's working with them. (laughs) Right. But if you get like a pressure sensor, you will see they are pushing themselves forward. Which is cool. And then there's other, you know, there's there's sort of the inchworm classic. You anchor belly. yourself up front, pull your tail up, and then anchor your tail and push the, the head section up. There's the belly muscle crawl. Yeah. That one's the weirdest one to me. But then there's sidewinding. Sidewinding is a special type of movement used by snakes to get over sand. And the reason that you use it to get across sand is because pushing your way along on loose sand doesn't work very well. That's why exercise enthusiasts like to jog on the beach because mm-hmm. it's hard. Yes, because it is because <laughs> it is bad to jog on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because every time you push into it, it yields. It's called a resistance exercise. <laughs> so sidewinding is this unique uh, type of movement where a snake will lay down on the ground in sort of a curled position, and it moves not forward but largely sideways. And instead of pushing itself along, it'll lift its head and some of its neck and jump the head and neck several inches to the side and then lay the head on the ground and jump the midsection of the body. So the different sections of the body are taking turns leaping forward while the other sections of the body are flat on the ground. Mm -hmm. So it's this sort of snake gallop yeah but at no point are you pushing yourself forward you are laying flat and then lifting apart it'd be kind of like if you laid on your belly with your arms and legs stretched out and moved your arms to the side over your head and then moved your legs in the same direction and then pushed down on the ground with your arms and legs and tried to lift the rest of your body and move it to the side? Well, the the way I, that it kind of made me think of is if anyone, when you were a kid and sitting on your butt and would scoot yourself forward with your hands by lifting yourself up and mm-hmm. sliding forward and then doing it's kind of doing that, except if you were a tube. Yes. This research aimed to look and see, well, there are certain species of snakes that are specialists at doing this. The sidewinders. The sidewinders. <laughs> do they, are they shaped differently? Oh. 
And specifically, they were interested in looking at the interface between snakes and their environment, the belly. Like that That's how snakes interact with their environment. Their very long foot. So they took a look at the microscopic structure of the scales on the bellies of shed skins of three species, the sidewinder rattlesnake, Crotalus cerastes, which lives in the southwest of North America, and the Saharan horned viper, Cerastes cerastes, and the Saharan sand viper, Cerastes vipera, both of which live in North Africa. And then they compared with, quote, normal snakes. Yeah. The, 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 what typical snake uh, bellies look like. Snakes that don't walk like a crab. And then ran mathematical models to predict how those different structures affect locomotion. And what they found is most snakes' bellies are covered in spikes. Hmm. Microscopic, very, very tiny spikes that point backwards. These are, you know, micrometer in length, and it's just rows and rows of spikes pointing away from the head and down towards the tail. Whereas the sidewinder species they looked at did not have many or any spikes, but instead their bellies were covered in little pits. Again, microscopic, you wouldn't see these looking at them. And they explain the differences. The tiny spikes, in the in the, uh, the article, the lead researcher describes it kind of like corduroy. <laughs> Where you mm-hmm. can run your finger one direction along corduroy and you can feel the texture yeah. sort of resisting you. But then the other direction, it's much smoother because yeah. you're going with the grain. Shark skin So to speak, very much like shark skin. That the shape of those microscopic spikes creates friction in that direction. Yes. They are designed to create friction that helps the snake push forward, which is great for your normal slithery undulating movement yeah, because for a that's, head forward movement that's what you want and that morphology is found in tons of snakes and tons of habitats in different environments but the pit like structure that we see on the sidewinders does not produce friction uh, very much at all and in particular in any direction mm-hmm. which means that those pits not only are they not creating friction for pushing but they're also not creating a lot of drag yep but if you try to pull a snake backwards along the ground there's going to be some resistance to it and then of course having a belly with far less friction and especially no directional friction is great for moving on sand because the way that it's suspected that these snakes are able to do this sidewinding is that every time they put down a section of their body They're spreading out the weight as much as possible so as not to disturb the sand. Yeah, to not create a big divot that they're now in. Right. And you don't want to push on it because if you push, it's going to collapse. You're going to slip. You're going to slide through it. Especially on like dunes where it's loosely piled sand. Yeah, exactly. And they even say that in the the article. Yeah, no, you don't want a dune to start collapsing underneath you while you're trying to run over it. I mean, we want that because it makes good fossils, but you don't. Yes. (laughs) So, uh, this is a physical distinction between snakes that do these different movement habits, which is interesting. Uh, They make a short point for engineering, because there's a lot of interest in making snake robots (laughs) that can move in different ways, because snakes are really good at moving in all sorts of different environments. So if you want search and rescue type robots, that's a great way to navigate places, because snakes are the best. But also... This just sounds like propaganda from Cobra evolutionarily it's interesting because the North African sidewinders and the American sidewinders are not closely related. That's That was going to be one of my questions. Yeah, this, this is two different groups, two different lineages of snakes, both still vipers, you know, they're still in the viperid mm-hmm, family, mm-hmm. that have converged on this similar spikeless pitted belly morphology for doing sidewinding. And the one last point that's super interesting is that the American, the rattlesnake that they looked at, had some spikes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. whereas the North African vipers had zero or very, very few spikes. And the authors suggest that that might be that the rattlesnake adaptation is more recent, mm-hmm, that it hasn't, mm-hmm. it's still got some essentially vestiges of the ancestral condition. 
which would make sense because deserts here in North America are only about 20,000 years old. Yeah. Whereas those African deserts are several million years old. Yeah. Those sidewinders have had a much longer time to adapt to that uh, lifestyle. That is fascinating. How cool. That's That's such a wonderful example of conversion evolution, both the pits on the belly, but also the fact that two different groups, if still vipers, you know, so still related, but mm-hmm. two different groups of snakes both arrived at the same odd, unique, bizarre locomotion for a particularly weird environment. Yes. You know, of dry sand. And that's fascinating. I, I, I want to see them sidewinding next to each other to like, to, to see what, it, how they look. And I, this is such a cool study because, and I'm not a, a snake expert and I don't study their scales, but I would never have even thought to be like, I wonder if they've got weird scales. Mm-hmm. But that makes so much sense. Of course they do. It's like wearing cleats versus wearing bowling shoes. Yes, a- absolutely. Like both are good for different purposes, but neither would be good at each other's job. Yeah. And I, that makes so much sense. Wow. Yeah, it, it's it's a really cool study, and it makes me want to know what the microstructure is of all snake bellies. Yes, no, uh, sea snakes next, please. Yes, do sea snakes. <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> They've got denticles like sharks. For, yes, exactly. For uh, hydrodynamics. <laughs> Just hydrofoils. Got those mosasaur legs. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of things that moved in odd ways, if we knew for sure how ground sloths moved. Sure. My next news is about ground sloths. Speaking of things on the ground. (laughs) That move over ground. This news is about a very old fossil of Megatherium, the famous group of ground sloths, which included some of the biggest. And this is one of the oldest that's ever been discovered. Cool. This research is by Nicolas Chimentoa et al., in the Journal of South American Earth Sciences, and the article is by Enrico De Lazaro in Sci News. So Megatherium ground sloths lived in South America, early Pliocene to the end of the Pleistocene, so 5 million to just just a little bit more than 11,000 years ago. Uh, they range in size. They had some that were fairly small, uh, but the most famous one is Megatherium americanum, which is elephant-sized, one of the biggest ground sloths to, you know, sloths to ever live. Found in Argentina, uh, Uruguay, Bolivia, all throughout the Pleistocene. They also pointed out in this, which I had never thought of, but it's true that according to tracks and the anatomy, sloths are believed to have been able to stand up and walk on their hind limbs, Mm -hmm. which would make it the largest bipedal mammal of all time. Oh, yeah. Which is... A, a, a nice title to have. That's pretty they, cool. Yeah, they clock in at like four tons, so it's, it's, it's much bigger than me. Remains of these animals are very common in the Argentina territory, which is where this new specimen came from. Argentina's Buenos Aires Providence, a new partial skull, which belonged to what seems to be a juvenile that is at least 3.58 million years old, Whew. which makes it one of the oldest on record, period. So Interesting. Just, one of the oldest within Megatherium. Yes. Cool. And so one of the oldest Megatherium ever discovered, and as they put it, the first undoubted record of Megatherium from the Pliocene of Argentina. Ooh. This is interesting both because, like, cool, o- old fossil. It's not quite a, a date range extension, so it's not quite that oldest or that old, but it is pushing toward the beginning of when we know megatheriums were around. Yeah, and at least the oldest in this region. In this region, for sure. But it also gives some more perspective on the timings of when megatherium was where. Uh, The previous mentality about megatherium is that it, as a genus, originated in the high Andes and then later dispersed, later spread out down into the lowlands. So up in the mountains is where it started and then spread out into lower environments. But this finding, as well as a couple of other megatherium specimens from the area, suggests more complex series of events and indicates that the diversity of lowland megatherium in the Pliocene may be underrepresented and that they actually may have been more diverse earlier on than it has seemed up till now. Or has seemed with previous interpretations. 
an interesting find. I, I'm always interested. The Mosasaur news also had this this same sort of theme of discovering something that makes us realize that we might be missing out on a whole chunk of the story. Oh yeah. They're like, here's a sloth at a time and a place where we didn't expect it to be. We haven't found it before, which immediately opens up the question of what else there is to be found. Yes, what else aren't we finding? Yeah, and what does it mean for our understanding, our incomplete picture of the diversity of habits of ground sloths over time? Well, in, like in the Mosasaur one, another thing that these sort of things that I appreciate about them is even as paleontologists who try actively not to bottleneck our view of of extinct animals, it's still very easy to be like, yeah, when I think of mosasaurs, I think of large, dominant apex predators. Right. But of it makes complete <laughs> yeah, sense. There was also a four foot long cookie cutter yeah, mosasaur. Like, of and of course there was, because like what predator is there not that version of it? Mm-hmm. You know, like if you go through groups of predators, they almost always have yeah, there's variety, a variety, there's and there's sizes. always weirdos. Yeah. So like, of yeah, of course there were weird mosasaurs doing things most of the others weren't doing, but it can be very easy to forget about that or to just not consider it because we either haven't found it or haven't interpreted it that way yet yeah and or at least if even if we do consider it to know what it might be yes exactly because until you start finding that you don't know that makes me think that there's always a weird one which makes me wonder what the weird version of sloths is the lot of snuts oh what is that thalassocnus thalassocnus the the swimming ones yeah i was gonna say either those or Modern sloths, modern like sloths, tree yes. sloths. That is <laughs> are, the weird are one. The weirdos, <laughs> uh, which is usually the answer when you go, "What is the weird version?" Modern sloths. Yeah, the ones that climb in trees yeah. and hang upside down yep. and move really slow they're and grow the mo- moss. They're the weird version for everyone because we're all related <laughs> to some extent. Well, that brings us to the end of the news. Maybe we'll find a sloth someday with tusks. Oh, wouldn't that be something? I wonder. How would we identify the tusks differently from the other teeth? How would we even know they were tusks and what not something else? Features will we look for? Maybe and what that's would, something. And what would that tell us about yes. them? Maybe those are things that we could discuss after the break. Extensively. <laughs> When we say tusks, I'm sure most people have an image that comes to mind. For me, I think the the two immediate images are elephants and walruses. Elephants come very quickly for for me. Uh, Pigs, uh, like warthogs, Mm -hmm. are are probably come to my mind a little quicker than walruses. Okay. Uh, But that's kind of the the thing that's interesting about tusks is it, it is another one of those topics where most people know what you mean when you say tusks and they know them when they see them but had you asked me before this if you were asked to describe them might struggle yeah what what makes it a tusk yeah well it's because it's a tusk yeah you know, that, that's what tusks look that's because like. it looks like a tusk <laughs> because when you think about it that what we call tusks in those three groups of animals we just mentioned elephants pigs and walruses they don't actually look all that similar no they don't look alike really at all and aren't even the same teeth right. in all three. Like, they aren't even the same thing in all three. It's not just that it's the same thing taking different shapes. They're actively different in a couple of these groups. Yeah. But it also makes me think that there are other animals with big teeth that we don't call tusks. Yes, yes absolutely. Because, that, and I'm sure you may be leading up mm-hmm. to mentioning this, but if someone were to say, well, they're just big teeth. Right, but we saber-toothed cats don't have we don't call those tusks. Tusks, right? And like things like rodents, which I'll go into more detail, on, have a lot of the same features. Mm-hmm. We don't call them tusks. So what's a tusk? So what's a tusk? Now, tusk is not a strictly rigidly identified term, as is to be expected due to their diversity and the diversity of groups that have them. So, of course, they're not all the same and they're not all functioning the same. But generally, commonly... Typically, tusks are specialized, enlarged front teeth. Right. So big teeth typically at the front of the mouth, 
at least there are no examples of back teeth that have become tusks that mm. I found looking it up. Just sticking out of the eye sockets. Yeah, more. through the cheeks. Usually, this is canines, your sharp teeth in your mouth, and incisors, your front teeth in the mouth. Right. Those front set of teeth, a almost always, but in a few more, a or two pairs become enlarged. And when we say enlarged, usually extending out of the mouth while closed. Right. So you can see them when the mouth is closed. Yeah. Whether open or closed, it is sticking out. Now, I want to make a point here because we you, you mentioned canines and incisors. Mm-hmm. And we discussed the different types of teeth in episode 88. But canines and incisors are specifically types of teeth found in mammals. Exactly. Tusks are mostly a mammal feature. Though there are some animals that have very tusk-like things or things we call tusks though whether you could say they're the same because they're different they're not mammal groups and Mm -hmm. most of the features of a tusk are based off of mammal teeth and mammal dentition which could be a bias of our modern world yep but also as we've mentioned many times mammals more than pretty much any other animal group have gone wild with tooth specialization we go crazy with our teeth Another very telling feature of most tusks is that they are ever-growing. So okay. these are teeth, which ever-growing teeth are not uncommon. We've talked about that mm-hmm. with various groups. You know, many things that are heavy chewers have teeth that are open-rooted, meaning they're constantly being fed blood and therefore can keep growing. Tusks act this way, but they're acting more like fingernails in that they're getting worn down by what you're doing with the tusks mm-hmm. instead of chewing with them because they're outside the mouth. So Tusks are not chewing teeth anymore. They're doing other stuff. They're being repurposed from food focus to various things. We'll go over that. (laughs) Something something outside the mouth. Something outside the mouth. A fun fact, when we see ever-growing teeth in other groups like uh, rodents and and rabbits and stuff, the rate of growth is actually fairly similar to some tusks. Like rodents and rabbits have a rough average range of 400 to 500 micrometers per day. Of growth, which is about the same as African elephants' tusks, which is 470 micrometers per day. Cool. Yeah. Huh. Similar tusk growth. Uh, some groups can even regrow a missing tusk. Elephants and walruses, if you remove the tusk, but you don't remove the cells, mm-hmm. the germinal cells at the base, it will replace their own tusk. Okay. Uh, so they can get it back. Yeah. Sort of like a fingernail. Yeah, exactly. You, you can lose most of your fingernail, but you'll still get a fingernail back. Tusks are also built a little bit differently than your average tooth. So most teeth, you have the inner pulp, which is the living part of the tooth. The dentin, which is the main bulk of the tooth, the bone of the tooth. The enamel outer surface, which is that hard, you know, crystalline-like structure, the hardest part of a mammal body. Yeah. And then down at the bottom, you have the cementum, which is in the root. Right, where it attaches mm-hmm. to the gum, typically. Most tusks are majority dentin and then little to no enamel right. so it's, it's just that that hard candy shell yeah on the outside and so it's it's instead of having that crystalline really hard outer part on like we do on our chewing teeth it's basically just the bony part so they don't have the same structure same protection there's also very particular about their cross sections they grow in very telling ways. You can actually tell species by the growth of their tusks very often. And different groups have different growth patterns that are not just normal teeth growth patterns. They're unique to the tusk. Yeah, that's uh, I learned that the way you tell I mean, fossils, te- tooth and other types of bone from ivory is the internal structure yep. of ivory is very distinct because of the way it grows. Exactly. They called elephants having a, a checkerboarded yes. sort of pattern. Yeah, those checkerboard lines have a name that I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's a specific term for mm-hmm. the lines you see in elephant ivory. Yeah, and and different groups would have different... So if you found a chunk of tusk, and in elephants it's called ivory, mm-hmm. and it's often... that I, The term ivory is used in other groups, but usually when you say ivory, you're meaning elephant. Tusks are also basically void of cells. There's not any living part in the tusk. It's all in the mouth but the tusk is just dentin just a structure now outside the mouth very very commonly they are sexually dimorphic uh not always there are groups that 
it, this is less true, but very often tusk bearing animals either show males having tusks and females lacking tusks, or if they both have tusks, typically the male's tusks are bigger and showier. Right. For various reasons, but that's very common. And these are very different groups, so it's not that in one group males develop tusks and that continue. This is just a common feature. It's even been connected to things like testosterone level. That tusk eruption seems to affect, be affected by testosterone level, so it has a connection to the male anatomy. Oh, cool. It's like a mustache. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, when it comes to comparing it to other long teeth, like saber teeth, fangs, why do walruses have tusks and not fangs? And why do saber tooth cats have fangs and not tusks? Right. And this is where we get into, there is not a cut clear definition. I've seen some animals that we will talk about in this episode referred to as both fanged and tusked. Mm-hmm. So it, it often depends on who's describing them. A common general rule that you'll see people use is if it's ever growing, it's a tusk. If it's not, it's a fang. Okay. You know, if it if it grows and then stops, if you break it and it won't heal, that's not a tusk. That's a fang. That's a just a long canine. It's just a long tooth. But there are some tusk-like features that seem to grow and then stop. They're not ever growing their whole life. Yeah, it's not a hard line between yeah. those two options. So there is no perfect answer for at what point is it one or the other. But for the most part, things are usually attributed with predatory animals and predatory tools. Yeah. That we call something a thing when that is the tool you're using to kill something. Yeah. And those there are some tusk predators like the walrus. Mm-hmm. Though it's not like your typical hunting things down, chasing them predator. Yeah. It is still eating animals. Most of your tusks, animals are grazers, herbivores, things like that. And the tusk is not part of killing their prey. Right. That's what, that's the, the, the distinction that I've heard before mm-hmm. is that if it's a big tooth that's still used for biting, yep. that's a fang. And if it's a big tooth that's not used for biting, that's generally going to be called a tusk. Though then we get into other weird categories. Of course. Like uh, the hippopotamus is a great I, one. I've, been, w- I've yeah. been wondering the whole discussion about hippos. I s- the hippo has come up in many examples when I was reading up about tusks, but they don't extend outside the mouth. Nope. They are ever growing. Interesting. So they are indeed growing like tusks. Did not know that. They are made up of both incisors and canines, because hippos. Yeah, if if you haven't, <laughs> dear listeners, Google hippo skull. But they're contained, and they're not used for biting their food, but that is how they use those tusks. Right, for biting. For biting. Either rivals or, honestly, whatever. Whatever they, gets in whatever their way. They feel like biting. <laughs> <laughs> and they will use it to kind of, like, charge. They'll open it, and some of the tusks point forward when their mouth is open, so they can use it like mouth horns. So, do those count? If you're asking me, I'd count them as tusks, but if we're being, like, nitty-gritty, maybe they don't. Yeah. Well, Maybe they're tusk-like teeth. Now that I think about it, um, we call the teleoceros, mm-hmm. the short-legged rhino that we have at Gray, uh, they typically have these big lower, uh, I think they're canines, they might be incisors now that I'm thinking about it, but big lower teeth, and we call them tusks, yep. even though they almost certainly wouldn't have stuck out of the mouth. Yeah, they, they barely stick past the end of the jaw. Yeah, they're they're small as tusks go but they are they function very much like tusks in that they seem to be ever growing they're even self-sharpened which is another feature of many of the tusks that we'll talk about interesting so that's another very tusk-like feature that they are sharpened in obvious weapon usage whether it's for (laughs) other males or for predators so self-sharpening uh in in the rhinos in particular the upper uh, correspondence of those teeth are shaped like whetstones Mm -hmm. they're these little rock these little knobs that the lower teeth grind against when they open and close their mouth to make this razor edge to sharpen them and indeed in the fossils still sharp yes i could absolutely stab someone with those tusks. oh yes and these are not the only tusks to do that which we'll discuss a little later Mm -hmm. so once again does that count i would but i am not a tuscologist right but many of the papers i read included hippos in their discussion even if they were like, yeah, but they're weird tusks. One made the point that if 
they were to keep growing without being worn down, eventually they could exit the mouth. <laughs> That's true. So they have the potential to be external tusks. Like proto tusks. They're just not meant to be. Uh, but others fall into this category. Uh, dugongs have tusks, have uh. tusk like front teeth, but you don't see it because of their big flabby face. So dugongs, cousins of the manatee, the sea cows, have very tusk like front incisors. Do those count because they're not sticking out? So there is not a clean definition. Some of these might be able to be argued one way or the other that we'll go through. But in general, it is an external tooth that is used for more than just biting and food acquisition, used for other things. It has become secondarily purposeful outside the mouth. One of the very interesting things about tusks is that they are exposed to the external environment, which for most teeth is very bad. Yes. If you leave your mouth open to the dry air or constantly leave it, like if you just swish water in your mouth and never spit it out all day for days, you'll damage your teeth. Too much water, too much air, dry air, the wrong pH, you know, acidity level in your mouth, all of those can damage your teeth fairly easily. You know, cause pretty common tooth degeneration. Tusks are exposed to all of these because they're exposed to the elements. Yeah, their all the time. All the time. And there are some features of the tusk that combat this. The fact that they're ever growing. So if I damage it, or if a part does get particularly dried, I'm going to grow more tusk. So it's not a permanent damage on the tusk as is. It's the permanent damage on that part, which will eventually wear down off the tip. Right. It's kind of like hair. Yeah. Or once again, like fingernails. I can chip a fingernail and, oh, that's a bummer. It will grow back. Mm -hmm. And then I will have more fingernail that is no longer broken. The fact that it is void of cells means it is resistant to infection or inflammation. That it, if it does get damaged, you're not going to get a tooth infection on the tusk because it's there's nothing to infect. Yeah, it's dead. Yeah, it's dead material. And the part that can feel pain is way away from the tip inside the mouth. So even if it does get some environmental damage that would hurt, the animal's not likely to feel it. So tusks are robust in the ways they need to be to be outside the mouth. So now let's talk a little bit about who has tusks and what are they doing with them? Tusk diversity. Tusk diversity. What is the variety of tusks and tuskers and what are they using those tusks for? Probably the most famous, proboscideans. Elephants. Elephants. Episode 66. Elephant tusks is what I, I would assume most people think of first when we say tusks. I know it's what comes to mind for me first and there's a good reason for it. Elephant tusks are the biggest tusks around today and the biggest tusks ever. Yeah. When you go back in the fossil record, there are even bigger tusks. Today, the two kinds of elephant, African and Asian generally, you know, not going into subspecies, both have tusks. Asian elephants have tusks that can reach up to like five feet, so a meter and a half long, and can weigh over 100 pounds or almost 50 kilograms, which is hefty. African elephants blow them out of the water, though, with their range going from five foot to eight feet long with some that almost push 10, which is about meter and a half to two and a half meters with their, their tusks also getting up to about a hundred pounds in weight. But in the fossil record, when you get to the mammoths, that's where you get the, the tusks. Oh yeah. These are the, the biggest tusks ever to be tusked. Woolly mammoths, which had instead of the slightly curved, mostly straight tusks of today's elephants had really loopy, curvy tusks. And these could get up to 14 feet long, so four and a half meters almost, 4.2 meters. But the largest tusk ever found was from a Colombian mammoth, which was 16 feet long, almost five meters. Whew. Yep. That's a, that's a lot of tusk. And even their range, like they ranged from 11 to 13 feet, you know, yeah. three and, and a half to four. Each tusk. Yeah. These are paired. Paired tusks, each one 15 feet long massive tusks and elephants use their tusks for just about everything. Like they kind of almost encompass the list of what everyone else is doing with tusks. Mm -hmm. They use it for fighting each other, for defending against danger, for manipulating food in their environment, you know, for getting food where they need it to be and, and help carrying it or knocking over trees, moving stuff for mining for chiseling salt out of the walls of caves mm -hmm. to get chunks of salt that they need. They will chisel it away with their tusk. I believe they do that with bark on trees yep. as well. They'll scrape bark off of trees. Absolutely. 
And because they have two long tusks, they also show quirks. They tend to be right or left tusked. I've heard this. Yeah, and you can tell because one will be more worn. It will show wear patterns from being used preferably. Cool. So just, yeah, variety of uses, hugely versatile. It, it's a major way in the in how they interact with their environment and allows them to do some ridiculous things. You know, just like knock over cars and stuff like that. Yep. So... Hugely useful in elephants today, uh, we can only assume what uh, the other things that some of the weirder tusks were doing with, like the loops. I've heard uh, ideas of them scooting away snow with the big loopy tusks on mammoths. Yeah, I've heard that too. And things like that. It also can be display purposes. It's a great way to show that I am a big powerful male. Yeah. Look Uh, how healthy my tusks are. As we've discussed before. Big exaggerated features are Mm -hmm. often good candidates for display features. But that's not the limit to proboscidean tusks. When you go back through the fossil record, there are even weirder tusks. Many of these we mentioned in the elephants episode. So Mm -hmm. if you want more focus detail, go back and check that one out. But Stegodon is famous for having very long tusks that were very close together and may have been too close for their trunk to rest between them. Yep. So it may have had to rest on top or to the side. So just these weird parallel tusks. Gompatheres, the shovel-tusked elephants, are had, very famous. Had shovel tusks. Had shovel had four tusks, two up top and two on the bottom chin. Yep. Which isn't too uncommon. No. A lot of mastodons have mm-hmm. lower chin tusks. A lot of elephants have had that. Absolutely. So that is not a unusual feature. The thing that makes them unusual is they have their lower tusks are often flattened into very flat head screwdriver like shapes. <laughs> <laughs> that's right flathead screwdrivers yes because what other screwdriver would they be shaped like? <laughs> it would be ridiculous to say anything else they, they they form this sort of spade yeah this scoop this shovel like structure that we've debated for years and years what they were using it for and we don't know yeah old classic pictures showed them scooping mud and water plants mm-hmm. which we don't think is likely anymore though it, still some of them could be doing that some wear patterns have suggested that they used it to scrape bark yep, due to the what groove. Which on the mural at the Museum at Grey is doing. Absolutely, because there's often a groove kind of worn in the middle where the two tusks meet. But another one suggested that at least one group in particular used it to scythe plants, grab it with their trunk, and then cut it with the blades of the tusk oh, to more easily get it to their mouth. Huh. We also don't know exactly what their trunks were doing with this big, long tusked bottom jaw. Classic art showed them with this flap-like duckbill trunk, which we don't think is likely anymore. That's not commonly shown, but we don't know what they were doing. They were so weird. And then you get to things like Dinotherium, which had chin tusks. Like a a tusk goatee. Yep. Incisors. So these are all incisors sticking out of the bottom of their chin and just coming down in two hooked tusks that bent back toward the body that we think it was likely using to shear vegetation, bark and limbs and stuff, but... We don't actually know for sure because no one has tusks like that anymore. So that's bizarre. Weird. So proboscideans were going crazy with tusks throughout their history and today are still very well known. Another very popular tusk group are the pigs. Yeah. The suids. Lots of tusks and pigs. Lots of tusks. Many f- pigs, you know, domestic pigs, when they go feral, start displaying more tusk-like teeth. But probably the most famous one that when you think of pig tusks is the warthog. Yeah. That's the one with the big hooked tusks. That's Pumba. Off to the sides. Off to the side, coming out of the side of the mouth. In this case, we're dealing with canine teeth now. Right. So yeah, you said the elephants and friends, that's an incisor. Very front teeth sticking out. But with warthogs, it's canines like saber-toothed cat sabers. Those are canines. But instead of coming down into just sharper canines, they're curving up into these upright hooks either side of the mouth little coat racks and they have four tusks two for the top canines two for the lower canines and they're different you know they're not all just doing the same you know tusk thing the lower pair are short and sharp they come out like little daggers and they're sharp because every time they open or close their mouth the teeth rub together just like the rhino and sharpen into these nasty little blades These are the tusks that people are always scared of when they talk about how scary hogs can be. Yeah. Those upper hooks are intimidating, but if a hog bites you, if a warthog gives you a bite, these things can cause actually serious injuries. Like, can be fatal to some animals. Yeah. Well, it it sounds a lot like uh, the tusks that you get on 
great apes. Absolutely, like yeah. Gorilla tusks. Yeah, those just these are more these almost I guess those are could, teeth. I don't know if those are tusks. Yeah, those uh, the thing. Yeah, yeah teeth. Those but, are fangs. Yeah. yeah. These <laughs> are very fang like tusks in yeah. this warthog. <laughs> the upper tusks grow much larger, stick out way above and outside the snout, and aren't sharpened, but they make these hooks and they can be up to ten inches long, so twenty five centimeters. And curve up to 90 degrees when they're curving up. And also back. So they have this almost kind of corkscrew shape to them. Yeah. They're sort of like if you, if you, if a group of animals wanted horns, Mm -hmm. but didn't have them, so made teeth in the horns. Which we will talk about that in a little bit later on. Well, interesting. Uh, These are used for combat, male to male, very commonly. Both males and females have tusks in warthogs. um, And. The males use them against each other very often, as well as for defense from predators, but it is used in competition. Uh, Not used for digging, as is commonly suggested. Uh, Mm. The snout is, but not the tusks, at least as far as I read. Females tend to use it much more for defending the young than competitive. And so they both have tusks. They're using them for slightly different, or more commonly for slightly different things. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, But... Both tusked. Yeah. Offensive. Exactly. Well, when you have to fight off hyenas to save Pride Rock. Yep. Got those tusks. Yep. When you're bowling for buzzards, you need tusks. <laughs> now, they are not the only tusked pig. No. Nope. Lots of pigs have tusks. The next most famous group of tusked pigs that I know of are the Barbarusas, mm-hmm. which are Southeast Asian pigs, cousins of pigs. Uh, they're still suids, but I don't know if you would call them pigs typically. These have tusks, but are very, very different. They have the same teeth. Their four canines are the tusks, so same teeth as other pigs. The bottom ones are doing the same thing. They come out as little daggers, but they aren't self-sharpening with the top like a warthog, so they have to sharpen it on trees and stuff to keep them sharp. The reason they aren't sharpening on the top tusks is because the top tusks point straight up and erupt out the top of the snout Mm -hmm. through the skin. Not sticking out the mouth, sticking out the snout. Yeah, p- piercing through the top of the mouth. And some have ridiculous upper tusks that grow out in these long, curly Q spirals. Now, not all Babarusa have that. There's actually many that just have little modest hooks sticking out the top of their snout. Still growing that way, but not growing into these weird hoops. And these hoops are so exaggerated that they can actually start to curl in on themselves. And because they are ever-growing tusks, there is one example that I was able to find of a skull where a male was impaled by his own tusk. Yep. And I've seen that. They don't, they can't confirm that it was killed by it, but it's coming back toward the forehead and makes this big loop. Do they have like a hole for the tusks to go through as they grow? Or does it just grow through the skin and bone? When you see the skull, it looks much more logical. Mm-hmm. The the socket of the tooth has rotated around the side of the snout and points up. So the, in the snout, like the bone of the snout makes complete sense. Gotcha. It's just growing out at the top. Right. I have heard in them and another group that it does basically have to go through a wound in the skin. Not that it's like an active, constantly infectable wound, but yeah, it's growing just through the skin. Weird. Yeah. Very weird. Weird. And it is weirder for the fact that we don't know what they why they have it, like what they're using it for. There's been lots of ideas. I found one old story that is like a local story, which is that they hung from trees on the loop of the tusk, waiting for male f- for females to come nearby. Naturally. And then you drop down. And you drop down. Like a drop bear. Another idea is that the males would use it to push their way through the underbrush to make a path for the females and young, mm-hmm. which maybe they do that, but that can't be why they have it. Right. Like that's not, that can't be the only reason it was evolved. The most common thing that people say is that it's used for fighting. Now, how it's used is debated, whether it's a shield for the other tusks. While I'm trying to bite you, I'm blocking your lower tusks with my big hoop face. Or there was one study I found, one article that said they would hook, basically entangle the other's lower tusks with the upper, the loop, and try to incapacitate them. Huh. Which makes sense when you think about it, But when I read a zoo article, a person who works with them says that stops making sense when you actually watch two of them fight and they don't 
use the tusks as much, they actually rear up on the back legs and box with their front hooves. Huh. So they don't seem to be using it. And when you look at the anatomy of the tusks, I've seen it mentioned that they are actually fairly brittle. So they're not robust like a warthog or an elephant tusk. They're kind of thin. So maybe they're just for display. Maybe it's just a peacock on my nose. Yeah. To make, to look fancy for the females. Which could make sense because unlike warthogs, females have no tusks. Interesting. None at all. Very, Not even small ones. Very sexually dimorphic. Very sexually dimorphic. All right. So it's, we're not sure. I did find one picture on Wikipedia of two male Babarusa that seem to be fighting with their tusks. So there are some scarring and wear pattern in, uh, that suggests that that's what they do. But then other evidence says maybe not. So, so they're doing something weird. And, and interestingly, because it's so sexually dimorphic, something likely to do with the interaction between males and females. Yes, something that either helps them get mates or helps them keep mates. And we're not sure what it is. Interesting. Tusk love. Which is not the only set of tusks that we're going to come across this issue with. Nope. Not pigs, but peccaries, close cousins of pigs. Yep. Javelina, as some people know them, are the mostly South American cousins of pigs. And they also have four canines that have become tusk-like. Once again, though, like the hippo, don't stick out of the mouth. Like, you wouldn't know they were tusked if you just looked at them in the face. But unlike pigs, their tusks don't angle out or curve. They're just... Basically two exaggerated, ever-growing canines. Yeah, big teeth. Big teeth, but they grind together. And this time the top and bottom grind together, which makes them both razor dagger sharp. <laughs> and once again, they aren't using them for chewing stuff, though I did see something that listed that they could use them to crack open nuts and stuff. So they might be using it for food. So is it a tusk? Is it not a tusk? I have to mention them, though, because nasty, nasty bites, like, they get a bad reputation for being aggressive because when you are bitten, it can be like you're going to the emergency room. But also I found a mention that said by rubbing the teeth together, because it rubs every time they open and close their mouth. And by especially doing that, they can kind of do this chomp that makes a clattering, is how it was described, clattering noise with their tusks as a warning to whoever's bothering them. And I was like, Really? I've never heard about that. And then I looked up a video and it's the most awesome, horrifying noise <laughs> I've ever seen and heard a hoofed animal make. So like we, we need to link that in the blog because it's amazing. So they're using their teeth for acoustic yes. properties. <laughs> it's stridulation of the mouth. Wow. Now we get to one of my favorite categories because I just, this may be one that not many people are aware of, are the fanged deer mm -hmm. or tusked deer. Once again, they're often called fanged deer, but in many of the papers, they were referred to as tusk. Right. We're dealing with unclear terms that vary animal to animal. But there are a number of species of small woodland deer around the world that have retained long, exaggerated canines. And I say retained because this is actually an ancestral feature of deers. Early deer had tusk-like canines as well as antlers. Many of these small ones, though, lack antlers and instead have these, they look like saber-toothed deer. Mm -hmm. like, and I've, I've heard them called that. Yep. Picture a tiny deer, you know, about half the size of a whitetail here for most of them. Big dog size, probably. It, with just two long, saber-ish, sharp fangs, sharp canines coming out that they use in male-to-male -male competition. That they've been observed striking at other males with these... These tusks, these include things like the musk deer, the tufted deer, which is named that because it has tufts of hair on the top of its head, hiding very small antlers, the Chinese water deer, and then my favorite of them, the mutt jack. Now, all of these have the tusk-like canines, upper canines only. The lower ones don't become tusky, but they also have a couple of weird features. For instance, the mutt jack has very notable functional antlers which most of the others lack. And this is a trend we see among deer that they, you either have antlers or tusks. Munchak has both and uses both during combat. They'll like fence with the antlers and then try to get an opening to strike with the tusks. And we're not quite sure, you know, people aren't quite sure why they have both. But both the Munchak and the Chinese water deer have slightly hinged tusks. Huh. Yeah. 
Hinged where? Hinged in the socket. They can move in the socket a little bit. Like a viper fang? Yeah. Which is the paper I found that was discussing it made that point that we didn't know, we didn't consider hinged, now they call them hinged fangs, Mm -hmm. but hinged canines, hinged teeth being a thing outside of things like fish and reptiles. Yeah. But they do. Now it's not ridiculous. They're not folding up into the mouth. Like a viper. Right. It's not like a switchblade. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but they can shift them by putting pressure on a couple of muscles. On the Chinese water deer, I believe it's the same as the snarl muscles. They can shift them. And what they think it actually is for is to get them out of the way while they graze. So it's eating mode and combat mode. Wow. Back for eating, forward for fighting males. That's awesome. It's pretty awesome. That's very cool. And they have a tough hairy section on the lower jaw that seems to partially sharpen the edge of the tusk so that they are weapon ready you know they're not just big tusk teeth they're actually sharp sharp enough to fight males with now i mentioned those ancestral deers those cousins of deers from the past hoplitomerix is one of these often called the prong deer now it is not a true deer but it is a deer-like ruminant Extinct group from the Miocene to early Pliocene of southern Italy uh, on an area that was once an island. And it is notable. It has those saber-like canines as two little tusks, very much like all these other deer, and five horns on top of its head. Yep. Horns, not antlers. Yeah. Horn Built in. Actual bony horns, one above the nasal bone, above the center of the skull, and then a pair over each eye socket. And it was a five-horned, tusked, deer-like cousin. And this is because before antlers arose, yeah, deer cousins had a horn-like stuff. Yeah. And so... This is a deer that didn't want to be messed with by anybody. In either direction. You couldn't come (laughs) at it from below or above. Now, one group I wanted to mention is rodents. I brought them up a little earlier. Rodents also have enlarged incisors. Yeah, which are ever-growing. Yep, they're ever-growing. They wear down not due to eating usually, but to interacting with their environment. They use them as tools for gnawing, for making their homes, for chewing down trees. But I've never seen them called tusks, which they are inside the mouth. I do believe they still have enamel on, on almost all of them. I don't know that there are any that have adjusted the anatomy of the tooth structure so they may be built too much like teeth to call them tusks the only one that that bothers me a little bit on is the naked mole rat who yeah does have external incisors because they have a flap of skin that comes behind it when they close their mouth yeah so they can use them as mining tools and don't swallow dirt that's very tusk like that, those th- those are tusks but i'd assume the enamel and the structure is probably i couldn't find any mention Interesting. I couldn't find anyone. I couldn't. I the only the closest I could find was like Cora, <laughs> and I couldn't find anything. I, I just no one is calling them tusks in any regard. Interesting. So this is one of those examples where it it sure does quack and walk like a tusk. Yeah, you're using it as a mining tool, but we just don't call them tusks. So there are gray areas. But the one example I did find was a fossil rodent known as Joseph O. Artigasia which was a large cousin of guinea pigs. Uh, They listed it as bull-sized. Very big. Yep. (laughs) I think that's the largest rodent ever. This is the largest rodent we know of to date. That's why I know that name. Two million years old from the Pliocene of Uruguay. This had a very robust skull, and they CT scanned it in one study to get an idea of what its jaw morphology and functioning would be like. And they reconstructed the lower jaw based off of a relative, a close relative to this animal. And what they found is that the forces predicted for the bite were extreme. They compared it to a tiger's jaw. Pull. Pull. (laughs) And that on top of that strong bite, the incisors seemed, in quotes, over-engineered. The incisors were prepared for forces greater than the bite could produce, which may mean that they they were experiencing forces being put upon them by more than just the jaw muscles, a.k.a. neck muscles, that the whole neck and jaw was getting into using those incisors, which could mean they were being used in very tusk-like ways. What were you doing? What does a bull-sized rodent with over-engineered tusks do with them? Anything it wants. (laughs) (laughs) 
Who were you biting? Yeah, so they could be digging for stuff. They could be defending from uh, hyper-aggressive predators. I I like to imagine that they were living like hyenas and they were cracking bones (laughs) to get the marrow. (laughs) So there, there does seem to be some tusked rodents. Now, we have more examples to talk about, but I want to take a break here. Because it's about time. Because it's about time, but also because next we're going to move to the water. Uh, That's what I was hoping this split would be. Some swimming tusks and see what some of those examples are. (laughs) Now, so far we've been wholly on dry land. And tusks are not just a feature of the land dwellers, the land lovers. There are a number of tusked aquatic animals. Probably, as you mentioned early on, one of the first that comes to mind is the walrus. Cousins of seals and sea lions. Walrus, the only species, two subspecies of walrus today, is very well known for its two tusks. Canines, in this case. That come down in a very saber-tooth cat-like fashion. Yeah. Except they're round instead of flattened. And they aren't used for hunting at all. They don't use those to get food like we used to think. We used to think they used them to dig up food. That they would go when they bottom fed. When they went down to the bottom of the water. Which they don't. They actually use almost none of their teeth while they're eating. Like we discussed in episode 104. They Mm -hmm. are the vacuums of the sea. They just slurp up their food. (laughs) The tusk is used... Actually, probably out of all these, most similar to like an elephant's in that it's extremely varied in what they use it for. Males use it to jab at each other and even like almost kill one another. They also use it to defend themselves from predators. They also use it to haul themselves out of the water. It's a grappling hook on their face. That's one of the weirdest. You're using your tusks to move yourself. And they'll use it to open up holes in the ice. They'll use it to maintain their breathing holes. Yeah, for mining. For mining the ice. For oxygen. You're mining for oxygen. (laughs) Uh, These are not measly tusks. They can get up to three feet long, so a meter long, and weigh five kilograms, roughly 12 pounds. So each, once again, Each. each. These are hefty tusks. One house cat per tusk. Now, both males and females have them here, though the males tend to be slightly longer, slightly more robust. So a bit more prominent. Females can still have very prominent tusks, but often are a little less notable. And this is because males use them in very direct competition with one another to maintain the harems that they maintain. They are very elephant seal in that regard that they have beach masters that maintain large groups of females and defend it from rival males. And that they likely work as a display. You don't even want to try it with me because look at my tusks. Look how cool I am. Do you want to go up against these? With my tusks. But once again, in the fossil record, not all walruses are like that. We mentioned it in our recent seals episode, yep. pinnipeds episode, so I won't go into too much detail, but there have been four tusked walruses, no tusked walruses, and only tusked walruses. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> at least one species had only tusks and no other teeth. Yeah. So even they've been going crazy with the tusks. You'd think... It seems like tusks would be a very specialized, once you do it, you're kind of stuck with that. But a lot of groups go, no, I can do whatever I want with this. Yeah. And now we get to probably the weirdest tusks on the list. I This, uh, assuming you're doing the one I think mm-hmm. you're going to, which of course you are, is not only one of the coolest examples of tusks, but one of the my favorite so weird that it's kind of annoying <laughs> thing that an animal has done with its teeth. Yes. The narwhal is a whale, this is a cetacean, that has the famous unicorn horn sticking out the front of its face, which is actually a tooth. A tooth. That long, almost 10 feet long, (laughs) three meter long tooth, spiral tooth sticking out of its face. And it is one of the most bizarre features in the animal kingdom. Here's some info about it. It is the upper left canine. I I, I just want to take a moment <laughs> to I'm a I, Will knows this. We live together. Yep. I'm a I'm a bit of an organized yes. <laughs> kind of person. The upper left, I hate it. I hate it yeah. a lot. <laughs> I saw it listed as one of the most extremes extreme forms of 
facial asymmetry uh, in asymmetry. the animal kingdom. It's just one. It's just one. Why? Now, here's where it gets really weird. They have two tusks. Yeah. The right one just never erupts. In the socket, it is a tusk. That's if you go inside the right socket of the right upper canine, there is a tusk waiting. It just never comes out, except sometimes when it does. It bugs me a <laughs> little. And yeah, I have seen yep. it there. You Sometimes you will get a double tusk. Yep. Uh, narwhal, what does it mean? <laughs> it annoys me a little bit. At least when snakes are like, no, we're just going to have one lung. Yeah. Well, that's because you're shaped like a tube. It's... Narwhals have no excuse. No, this is super weird. <laughs> Only males have the tusk. Typically, every now and then you get a female with tusk. Because once again, they have two tusks. They just never erupt. Yeah. They're in their face the whole time. <laughs> the tusks have a, as I saw it put, distinct left hand spiral. <laughs> so that they spiral to, to the, the left, left. <laughs> and it is covered in cementum the part that's typically only at the base of the tooth in the socket they're covered in cementum oh interesting yeah because they just had to be weird in one more way mm -hmm. and then like the babarusas it comes through the skin of the face oh it does that's right yeah. which those two are really the only ones with tusks that we know of that do that they have wolverine tusks yes that just come through your face weird yep and then they have no other functional teeth other than that tusk <laughs> no teeth they eat large fish and they do it all by suction they just inhale fish and all of their tooth growing goes into one spike out the front of the face and the females don't even do that they do one thing and they do it real well there is a second pair of tiny teeth, non-functional, vestigial, little teeth in sockets alongside the tusk, next to the tusk, that from the paper I read, they don't know what teeth they are originally. <laughs> like incisor your canine. Yep, we yep. don't know which type they are. And there's major variety in where exactly they are, how they're shaped, and what their growth, the histology, the internal structure of them is. So they just got these two little nugget teeth that they're not using. They just have them. Weird. Weird, weird animals. What a weird group of animals. So what's it for? That, uh, yeah. And, and what are they even doing with it? And we don't have an agreed upon answer. There are a few that come up more commonly, but we don't actually super duper know. Uh, there's a bunch of classic ideas that have been suggested over the years that it was used to dig for prey, mm -hmm. that it was used to pierce prey. To defend themselves, to poke holes in ice to make breathing holes, mm -hmm. as a cooling mechanism, as a sound transmitter. <laughs> like a radio antenna. It's a tuning cord. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like to imagine they also pick up the noise yeah. like an antenna <laughs> yep. with yeah. their, their, their horn. But the most common ones you'll hear are that it's for display and fighting, yep. for the males to show off and fight over females, which there is evidence for. There is scarring on the males that seems to be the result of the tusk okay and broken tusks are not uncommon among adult males All right. and they seem to have a burst in growth at sexual maturity okay so seems to be linked yes. perhaps to that sexual dimorphic uh, uh trait but then also the structure of the tusk shows many pore like structures on the outside and an abundance of nerves connected to and associated with the tusk hmm. that have led many people and there's been research on this that seems to support it that it is a sensory organ that can sense water through the pores and take information from it for some purpose so it's a dowsing rod it's a dowsing rod <laughs> now it's not to say they couldn't be doing both of course but evidently it might be a sensory organ so it is an antenna <laughs> it is an antenna and so we still aren't 100 percent sure and then a few years ago, 2017, drone footage caught multiple videos of narwhals using their tusk to rapier style flick and stun arctic cod, small fish, and then gobble them up. So just like, not not even piercing them, just no. smacking them with Thwack them. Whack them. Which is something that other animals like sawfish mm -hmm. will use their snout for that. And uh, I think I've seen swordfish will do something similar, uh, though don't quote me on that one. But yeah, that... They may be using it for food acquisition, but by stunning animals, by just shaking their tusk around right at them, and it is long enough that they can just thwack, just little fish. Weird. And when this came out, it was very much touted as like, all right, we figured it out. 
but there's still all this other evidence, so maybe it's doing all three? Little do we know, we have yet to witness that narwhals have a death roll ability. <laughs> to the left. It just, just a they spin drill. To the left. <laughs> <laughs> they just take down whales. But they are not the only tusked whales. There's another group, the beaked whales. Okay. Which have on their lower... So they look... Picture a dolphin in your head. Picture a dolphin in your it. mind's eye. Along the lower jaw, at about the middle of the jaw... The jaw extends up in two swoops, two little hills along the upper jaw, along the side of the snout, above it, and then have two little crusty, knobbly, tusk-like teeth sticking up off of it. Huh. That's a thing that exists in the world, and now you know about it. (laughs) Take that, everybody. Have some knowledge. These are the beaked whales, genus Mesoplodon which has 14 species in it, making it the most speciose of all the orders of cetacea. Huh. So they're actually one of the most diverse of the whales. And they have this weird face. Very poorly understood, very rarely seen. They live out in the open ocean. They hunt very deep, deep, deep down for squid. And are, those diverse, evidently have low abundance, at least according to our current understanding of their population. Mm Mm-hmm. I couldn't find any mention of what the teeth are, the tusks, what are, they were originally were, whether they're canines or incisors. Only the males seem to have this weird beak shape. Females are effectively toothless. It does seem to be competition, have a competition usage among the males because there's scarring once again okay. between them. It could very well be to attract females or to distinguish species since other than the tusks, They look very similar species to species. Mm -hmm. So display one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And then we get to the strapped tooth whale, a member of this group, which has two tusks. It's sometimes called the Laird's beaked whale. And it has its two tusks that come up the side of its snout and then bend over toward the middle while arching back toward the face. Over the top of the upper jaw. Right. Limiting the amount that they can open their mouth. Right. Once again, only in males, but they measured it. On average, males have about a three to four centimeter gape. They can open their mouths about three to four centimeters wide, while females and young can open their mouth twice that. Huh. So actively limiting how wide they can open their mouth. Weird. Yeah. What whales? Yep. But research shows it doesn't affect how much they eat. It doesn't seem to affect the size of the food nor the amount of food that they're taking in. So evidently it's not affecting their eating at all. And they do seem to use it to compete with each other. Probably not using the whole tusk, but a small, sharp denticle on the top of the tusks. So once again, animals that wanted to have horns. Yep. But had to settle for teeth. These are also the largest member of the beaked whales at around 6 meters or 20 feet long. (laughs) And a thousand and three hundred kilograms or a ton and a half. Weird. Yeah. They also dive down super deep and eat squid. So. All right. Whales. Whales have taken the prize <laughs> for just the what? What are you What are you doing? There's one more, but we have to go to the fossil record for it. Odo Benocetops. I, I love this name <laughs> because just a little breakdown. Odo Ben is... Walrus is walrus. Presumably, seat C E T could potentially be whale, mm-hmm. and ops's face. Yep. Is this the walrus whale face? It, it is a whale face? with the face of a walrus, basically. Oh boy. This is extinct whale, fairly small, seven feet long, so only, just oh, a little bit more than a whale. couple meters from Peru and Chile in the Neogene, so very recent. It had two narwhal-like tusks. Very, very similar, very unicorn, thin, pointed tusks that faced backwards off the face down either side of the body. (laughs) (laughs) Like, like weird pointy whiskers? Yeah. It looks like a catfish with, with barbels coming off, except those barbels are tusks. The tusks could often be up to a meter and a bit, so around four feet long. And the left one could often grow, or the right one often would be much longer, so the Left one would often only be about a little less than a foot, 25 hey, centimeters. I hate that. <laughs> so offset. Now, the only skull we have seems to be a male. So we can't say whether only males had it. Uh, we don't know for sure. 
The Tusks are very narwhal-like, though they are relatives of narwhals. The Tusks seem to be convergently evolved. Of Uh, course. (laughs) And their skeletal structure seems that they had a very mobile neck, so that they could probably bend their head over 90 degrees to utilize those to, tusks to stab to the side mm-hmm. like uh I, I think they're called stiletto snakes <laughs> yes yes like stiletto snakes snakes that have their their fangs stick out to the side and they'll whip their head to the side and stab stuff prey i i if i remember correctly they're venomous another thing that makes them weirdly different from narwhals narwhal that's the canine coming out which mm-hmm. means it's in the maxilla which is the main tooth bearing part bone on your upper jaw the premaxilla, which is the bone that holds the teeth in front of that, is where like all your incisors are. Tusks on a narwhal is coming out of the maxilla because it's a canine. Right. And it's coming out of the left. The prominent tusk for this whale is coming out of the right premaxilla. So it seems to be an incisor or something very similar. <sighs> um, and it had a very broad, flat snout similar to a walrus, probably bottom feeding like a walrus. Weird. So... Yeah, you thought we had talked about weird tusks. Whales. <laughs> Apparently whales. Don't mess around. Jeez. Now, even with us moving to the ocean, we're still talking about mammals. Yes. There are a few non-mammal animals that seem to have tusks. Not a lot. Uh, you do get some like sawfish, which have outer mouth teeth-like structures on their snout, mm-hmm. on their rostrum, that are ever-growing and are used for defense, but also to catch prey. So they're kind of tusky. You know, so you get some fish that have external mouth teeth that you could potentially call a tusk, but it is very anatomically different than a mammal tusk. So hard to say. There are a couple of fossil groups. Dicynodonts. Yep. The very famous therapsids from the Permian through Triassic. One of the most you know famous and successful groups of that time. The little... M- mammal cousin kind of lizardy body beak faced squat little animals that were anywhere from pretty small you know smaller than a badger to quite large like uh, rhino size i think are the biggest ones had a beak but on either side were tusks little external tusks and that's actually where their name comes from diacinodont two dog tooth and some of these even had weird tusks rastodon had two tusks that curved forward instead of down huh so very famous, successful tusk group. Not, you know, they're cousins of mammals. Yeah, they're, but they're on the mammal line, but they're not quite mammals. Not mammals. And then one example that I could find of people using the word tusk around a dinosaur. Mm-hmm. The heterodontosauridae, named for their heterodont teeth, their differentiated, different shaped teeth in their mouth, yep. had a third tooth on the upper jaw and I think it was the first tooth on the lower jaw, if I remember right, that were greatly enlarged in very canine-like shape. Right. Canana form. So sharpened, larger, more prominent than the other teeth. The bottom one, though, was even more prominent than the upper and actually fit into a little groove in the upper jaw. Like an alligator. Like an alligator when it closed and has been called very tusk-like. Interesting. Now, it also has some features that are less tusk-like. Uh, many of them seem to be serrated, sharpened on the front and back. But there is some evidence that it may be something they develop as they get older in adulthood. So it could be something that's meant for adulthood behavior and therefore could be very tuskish. One of the type specimens uh, for one of these species, a Brictosaurus, lacked tusks and was initially labeled as a female. But studies on the... Ver- the vertebrae showed that it wasn't fully fused and the short face led more recent studies to suggest that it was a juvenile may not have grown the tusks and in. therefore may not have so it may be that the tusks are something you get with maturity so there may be tusked dinosaurs i mean there almost certainly were surely but we had one example that seems like it may have something we could potentially call tusks cool and that, that's going to bring us to the end of our examples, but there, there's many more specifics I'm sure that people can think of. So if you have a favorite version of tusks, let us know. We'd oh, love yeah. to hear what your favorite tusks are. Seems to be, perhaps not surprisingly, a common thing to do to take your teeth and shape them to do something different. Mm-hmm. But there is some debate and mystery about why and how. What causes an animal? 
to take a tooth, a perfectly fine in the mouth tooth, doing its job, and then just inflict it upon the world, <laughs> <laughs> and, just, and just make it wrong. Yeah, just go crazy with it. And there's a couple of things that seem to affect this. Definitely one of the big ones is sexual selection. Yeah. Competition between males for females or for territory to then probably get females. Hmm. That these often go hand in hand with that. Many groups show that as a usage for their tusks. Elephants, walruses actively use these against other males. And there is substantial evidence for groups like narwhals. There's actually a study that collected data on 250 males over the course of 35 years. So like ob- observations, and I, I think some of them were uh, specimens from hunters because uh, there are still native people that hunt them traditionally. Mm-hmm. And they found that the growth pattern of the tusk is not linear with age, but it does show a, a disproportionate growth that seems to go with maturity and with the size of the male. Right. So it does seem to be a feature that gets bigger faster and seems to provide solid evidence for it being sexually selected, that this is something they want to get big and exaggerated more quickly than other features of their body. You know, it's not growing at the same size as their tail fins and stuff like that. And there have been observed tusking, engaging their tusks together, maybe not jabbing each other, but like fencing, rubbing the tusks together. Yeah. Yeah. Which could be competition, but it also might be communication. It might be social, you know, to establish hierarchy of, listen, we don't actually want to impale one another, but let's let's measure. Right. You know, <laughs> let's measure up and see, yeah, you should back down because right. obviously I'm the winner. You know, so there could be some definite competition there. And then this is supported in the fact that many are sexually dimorphic, not just in the males having bigger tusks, but many tusked animals, females lack them. Yeah, and and this makes sense evolutionarily mm-hmm. when you think, especially with mammals, if your two males are going to fight each other, your most mammals share at least the one tool <laughs> that you can bite each other. So if you're already doing that, and there are tons, right, apes yep. will bite each other for competition. We see it in some carnivores. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'll do that. Hippos, like we discussed. So it's kind of an obvious choice to then, well, let's make some of those into even bigger and better weapons. Absolutely. And in even in those other non-tusked mammals, there is a trend of males typically having larger canines. Oh, yeah. And, and t- t- all, cats and apes. And very, us. And yeah, On very average, often do. Testosterone does seem to link up with more exaggerated tooth structure, especially the canines, the mm-hmm. biting teeth. So, it, yeah, it makes sense. Just flip that switch a little more and let's really go crazy with those canines. Well, yeah, it, it's, it becomes an arms race, a, yeah. tooth, a tooth race yes. of who has the bigger, stronger teeth. And before you know it, you've got walruses. <laughs> Look what you did. <laughs> now, another question is, okay, but why teeth? Why not horns? Right. You know, a lot of animals use horns for all those same reasons. Mm-hmm. Also defense and, you know, fighting off predators. So why do some animals go with tusks, other goes with horns, especially in the artiodactyls, the even-toed ungulates, which are full of antlers, horns, and tusks? Yeah, you've got antlers on your deer, for mm-hmm. example, horns on things like sheep and bison, yep. and then tusks like the deer that you were discussing. Yep. And, and uh, our... And warthogs. Our and pigs, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And pigs. So... What, 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 what's the deal? Also, it's worth noting that camels have little fangs. Yes. Yes, they do. I'm and just going to throw that out there while we're talking I about... I do believe the males are more prominent. <laughs> that wouldn't surprise me. It, because camels and llama males, as far as I've heard from my family members who raise llamas, use it to castrate their rivals. Mm. Camels, we have... it. Yeah, no, camels are... Ter- they'll also, like, try to crush each other's skulls beneath yep. their chests. Anyway. Yep. Uh, it's just cute humped back camels. Oh, they're just Aww, so great. So cute. Careful, they spit. <laughs> there was a study that took a look at artiodactyls, looked at 63 species, and factored in what features they have, what's their body size, where do they live, and what's their social behavior to see what factors seem to trend out mm. toward one, one type of weaponry versus another. And they found that there are two... Strong trends. Uh, there's actually all three trended, uh, but where they live 
and who they live with seem to be very strong indicators and tend to group out in the smaller and larger artiodactyls. Smaller artiodactyls that live in denser environments, forests and places like that, swamps, and live more alone usually keep their tusks instead of growing headgear, while larger artiodactyls living out in the open and in groups more often had antlers and horns. Interesting. Yeah. Here's the logic. Mm -hmm. In a densely forested area, tusks are better than antlers or horns for a couple reasons. One, you don't want big headgear in a dense area. Right, you don't want to get caught on the branches. Yeah, you don't want to get caught because that does happen. Like, there have been deer skeletons found dead because they got their antlers caught in a branch and couldn't dislodge them. So you don't want to be sneaking through the underbrush with just this coat hanger on your head. So a little sharp, as they put it, daggers, not a broadsword. Yep. You want little sharp tools that you can carry with you and still defend yourself. Also, if you're suddenly to come upon an enemy in the underbrush, you don't want something you need to charge or necessarily rear up with. You want just something you can go over and bite them. Mm -hmm. So little sharp weapons, better for that. Out in the open, no problem. You can go crazy with headgear. And if you're more social out in the open, I can see headgear from far away. That was my first thought, mm -hmm. is that in an open environment, you have a big display feature. Display. There's no reason to have big ornate antlers when you can only see me from three feet away down in the underbrush. Mm -hmm. So I will just keep my little sharp uh, tusks. That's cool. And we see this with deer. Bigger deer tend to have no tusks and antlers. Smaller deer tend to have no antlers and tusks. Yeah. So, like, it pans out. It doesn't pan out perfectly. They point out that there are members who just throw this all out of whack. The muntjacks, who have antlers and tusks, just, yep. <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, they said maybe they're in a transition. Okay, that yeah. they, they don't live in a fully forested or fully open environment. They can't decide. They're not tiny as some of the other deer, but, you know, not as big as others. So, yeah, maybe they're kind of in between. And then they said hippos should follow this rule. Wow. Well. <laughs> But don't, and what it may be is that they're aquatic, and you don't yeah. want antlers while you're trying to swim. That makes sense. Also, I would explain it by, A, hippos do whatever hippos want to yes. do. But also, they're aquatic, which means it's only a matter of time <laughs> before they've just got spiral <laughs> tusks sticking out in all directions. It's going to look like antlers, but just coming from the mouth. <laughs> but it, And they would be, of course, hippos sticking through... Yep. Seven directions of the jaw. Yep. They'll show those crocodiles. <laughs> <laughs> and there is some evidence that tusks might be a driver of speciation with things like the beaked whales, who a lot of studies I saw mention them using those tusks as species identification for females to correctly identify the right species of male and avoid hybridization. Right. And there is some evidence for that. One paper I found noted that in the areas where multiple species of beaked whale overlapped and were closely related, they tend to have more differentiated tusks. But then in more distant but still closely related species that weren't overlapping, their tusks seemed, often were more similar. Gotcha. And so that it very well may be something that helps isolate the species in places where you can just swim over toward, you know, there's no physical barriers the tusks may be acting as that speciating force by identifying the species. Interesting. So there are definite trends in the evolution, but it's very different depending on which group you're looking at. A lot of it doesn't seem to be clear, and there's also plenty of weird contradictory exceptions sure. that go against the trend. And there are some groups that seem to just do whatever they want, Yeah, and there's like elephants. Yeah, exactly. And there, then there are tusks that we still don't know why they're there. Yeah. So we're still learning a lot about tusks. Uh, it seems like something we should have a handle on, but no, we're learning a lot about it still to this day. Very cool. I briefly wanted to mention that another cool aspect of tusks is their significance to us humans. They are very, very important to us in multiple ways. Historically, tusks have been very important in human trade and tool making mm -hmm. and artistry. We've used tusks to make functional tools. There's many, many classic examples of 
hunting weapons and decorations made out of tusks, uh, you know, mammoth tusks and stuff like that. Yeah. For Paleolithic humans. There was one paper I found from 1987, so I haven't found any other mentions other than this one, of a Paleolithic Polish boomerang made out of mammoth tusk. That's cool. Right? A 23,000-year-old mammoth tusk boomerang. Wow. So we've been interacting with tusks for a long time. Nowadays, as scientists, tusks are very useful for telling us a lot about the animals. They can hold huge records of information about the life of an animal. Uh, There's examples of it being used to show seasonality in the animal's lifespan. Uh, One did oxygen isotope studies and found that correlated with the water intake so that you could see when they were taking in winter water and not winter water. Right, right. Because it's a a part of the body that grows continuously Mm -hmm. throughout the life of the animal. So it's recorded. It makes me think of I had a friend in middle school and high school who had had a, a rat tail yep, yep, in yep, his yep. hair ever since he was a kid. And as he got older, he would point out sometimes that you could see his hair change color yeah. across the length of the hair from when he was little. Yep. And the tusks will do that. They'll hold on to signals of the health or environmental conditions of the animal the whole time. Exactly. And we can even get information about... The- what they were doing, there is one example I found of a a juvenile baby woolly mammoth tusk that carbon and nitrogen isotope studies were able to potentially identify that it was still weaning. It was weaning oh. off its mother's milk, coming off of the milk and starting to take in solid food because of the isotopes correlating with those two and looking similar to when elephants are weaning and... According to them, the juvenile was about five to six years old, which indicates that they were still weaning or finishing up weaning by about that old. So pretty, uh, a good long time feeding off mother's milk and that it had potentially not yet finished weaning because they didn't ever see the isotopes level off. Yeah, yeah. It's just little time capsules. Mm -hmm. So very useful for research, but I would be remiss without mentioning the ivory trade. Right. Our obsession and fascination with tusks has not ended in the modern day and elephant ivory became a target of it long long ago thousands of years ago but it became truly insane in the 1800s in the 1900s during what i've seen quoted as ivory frenzy like an ivory rush an like ivory a gold rush, rush. Yep. yeah and part of what fueled that was A civil war, the Mozambique civil war that lasted from 1977 to 1992, which was heavily fueled by ivory trade. Mm. And the numbers I've seen said that in the 1800s, there was about 26 million elephants. Today, there's about 1 million. (sighs) And well, because when you it's it's a whole lot easier to take the ivory off an elephant mm -hmm. if it's not struggling. And. That's actually what it rebounded to after there was a worldwide ivory ban in 1989. But in more recent years, 2008, so not too long ago, uh, there was a couple of sales of stockpiles that entered back into the market. And there's seen another decline. Uh, The number I saw said that in 2012, 25,000 elephants were killed in Africa. So there may be a relapse happening. Now, I'm not just mentioning this to be sad or to get on a soapbox and say, don't buy ivory, but don't buy ivory. Don't buy ivory. Don't don't, don't support don't. the mass murdering of elephants. It's, it's really horrible. But there is some interesting things happening due to this. Specifically, coming off of the Mozambique Civil War, so many elephants were killed during that time. Uh, it said that before the war started, there was roughly around 4,000 elephants in that area which dwindled down to three digits. They didn't give specifics, but Mm -hmm. hundreds of elephants after it. In one area where uh, a study happened, they had 200 known female elephants. You know, not, so we're not looking at the males, just females. And what was interesting is over half of them, 51% that were 25 years or older, so the ones that survived the war, were tuskless. Yeah. Now, African elephants, males and females have tusks though females sometimes won't it's just 
It's kind of like being born with or without wisdom teeth. Just, yes, sometimes they don't have It's a rare trait, but sometimes that happens. Yes. And the daughters of those females, 32% of them are also tuskless. Mm -hmm. Almost a third. Normally, tusklessness only occurs in about 2 to 4% of female African elephants. It has jumped up considerably, and all signs point to that poaching has selected for tuskless elephants. Yeah, because if you're killing all the elephants with tusks, then they're not passing those yeah. traits on as much. And the ones who happen to be born without tusks are doing better. They're not getting bothered, they're not getting killed, and they're the ones passing their genes on. Yep. And this is not the only place where it's been cited. There is one place in South Africa where 98% of the 170 females there were tuskless. So most of them, almost all of them. This is also something that's known in Asian elephants, uh, where tusklessness is much more common. Males typically will often have tusks in Asian elephants, and females very often won't. But there are many times, much more common than African elephants, where males won't have tusks in the Asian elephants. And a lot of people have pointed to that they were also hunted for ivory, and tusked individuals were taken out of the wild for service work and for being used as mounts and as beasts of burden so they were being taken out of the wild gene pool and that's after decades and decades of that happening in asia that that may be why we see those tusk features in them and in certain groups it's been noted that the tusk sizes have reduced even in males that young offspring from the survivors of this heyday of poaching have statistically reduced tusk sizes and the reason this is fascinating is all the reasons that they're evolving away tusks they're being selected against it but also they seem to be surviving all right Mm -hmm. which is surprising considering how much an elephant uses its tusks for its environment apparently at least in the studies and observations that have been made most of the tuskless elephants have found workarounds either coming behind tusked elephants to benefit from when they knock down a tree or just finding other ways to still get to the food they need and still get to the resources they need and still survive. What a lot of researchers are now wondering is how is this going to affect all the other animals that rely on the environmental effects of a tusked elephant? Yeah, if you can't knock over a tree anymore or whatever, is that going to affect all the things that we're relying on you to knock over a tree? Yes. So what's going to happen to elephants And the environments that they maintain. And the answer is we have no clue because this is happening right now. Yeah. So this is something that is happening as we speak that we are still understanding. So we don't know what's going to come of this. In the future, will elephants not have tusks? Yeah. Will all elephants just have lost their tusks? Fascinating and depressing. Extremely depressing. It's really, really sad. Yeah. Hey, maybe if we just... uh, Keep poaching and hunting and killing. We can naturally select all the cool, beautiful features out of animals in the world. And then nothing will be interesting. Yeah, we're selecting against the things that people have greed for. Yeah. Well, and we're selecting against some of the most awesome and lovely traits. (sighs) Yep. So tusks. Tusks. What a fascinating topic. Oh, it's a wild ride. Of discussion. Just this... All over, particularly the mammal uh, Mm -hmm. uh, family tree. It really, like, if anyone has a claim to fame, it's the mammals. Yeah. And like we've said before, teeth. Teeth. If any group is going to do something just ridiculous with teeth, it's going to be mammals. They're not the only ones. Nope. But, oh boy, do they, have they capitalized on it. And even within mammals, though, we still do see some of those weird trends. I couldn't find any listings of a predator other than the walrus. Mm Mm-hmm. Who is described as tusked? Right. You know, I'm not. That doesn't mean there aren't some, but it's not usually a predator feature. Yeah, and there are certain groups that are See, very diverse, yeah. but didn't come up. Uh, the first one that comes to my mind is bats, for bats. example. That's uh, one of the papers made the point that if tusks are a sexually selected trait, why don't we see similar structures in other highly sexual selection? you know, selected animals like birds. Mm -hmm. Like we get the birds of paradise, but why aren't any of them making tusks out of their beak? Like why aren't we seeing more stuff like that in other groups that also 
rely yeah. on display. Then maybe it is a mammal mm-hmm. type thing. So complicated, weird, strangely mysterious topic. Yeah, very cool. It. I had so much fun looking this yeah, one up. Yeah, thanks to everyone who requested it. This was fun. Absolutely. Now, before we finish our episode, there is one more section, which is our patron question. If you sign up with Patreon, not only do you get us to shout your name out at certain levels, but also you can ask us questions that we'll answer, read out and answer here on the podcast. Like so. Like so. This episode's patron question is about squamates. Yeah. The best of the reptiles. (laughs) Specifically, uh, mentioned snakes. This question is from Dawn, who asks, In many animals, the male grows larger than the female. Why do we see the opposite in snakes? Good question. It is a good question. Fitting question with all the sexual yeah, dimorphism no, we've this been is, talking with, about. With all the squamates and sexual dimorphism, <laughs> this is a great episode for it. Um, it's an interesting question, and I think that uh, uh, to take a step back from snakes specifically, uh, we should point out that it is very common for males to be larger than females, especially in mammals. Yeah. But females being larger than males is actually possibly even more common. I would I would be willing to bet money that it is the more common. Because it, it's common in some reptiles. Yeah. Very common in fish. Very, very common in fish. Uh, sharks, mm-hmm. uh, lots of fish. No, and even, you know, I mean, there's obviously weird examples like anglerfish. Yes. But also, you know. Great white sharks, mm-hmm. uh, I mm-hmm. believe females are bigger. I think most sharks, if they're not, if the female's not bigger, they're the same size. Yeah. I, I don't, I personally don't know of an example of a shark where the male's bigger, but I'm sure there is one. And then invertebrates. Yes. It, insects, it's very common for females to be larger. There are a lot of parasites mm-hmm. that come mm-hmm. to mind. Uh, like the, uh, the, 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 we've talked about the barnacle, yep, yep, parasitic yep. barnacles and the isopod, the tongue eating yep. isopods. Where the females are larger. So I think that the the shortest answer is mammals are weird. <laughs> when a very common trend that you'll see where when it is the males that are bigger is not always, there's exceptions to this, but is in social animals. Yeah, where they are. And, and typically where it's male dominated mm-hmm. social structure, males are in control of resources, territory, who gets to live where... Well, it's because you can, uh, 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 in those situations, the typical difference is that a male can have a harem, but females have a limit to how many offspring they can maintain and give birth to. Right. So a male can have an unlimited amount of females and basically, yeah, he can mate with all of those. So there's a reason to fight for more access. Well, and in mammals, a lot of times you'll see that the split of females are devoting lots of energy exactly. to the extremely expensive task mm-hmm. of having offspring, whereas males are devoting lots of energy to being ridiculous. To, to accessing to, yeah, yeah, the to, female. To securing territory, mm-hmm. to fighting each other off. Because like crocs and, and gators are also male sexually like male larger sexually dimorphic Mm -hmm. even though they're reptiles but it's because they're fairly social for reptiles and they're competing over territory and females uh now with other groups like birds i don't know how much size difference there typically is i know there are ones where it's notable Mm -hmm. but i don't i can't think of a good example but the most the distinctive thing is that across most birds males tend to be more colorful and flashy and display heavy because it's the same logic, but they're not fighting over it. They're displaying over it. But in, in t- cases where females are larger than males, a lot of the time it comes down to the fact that females need bigger bodies. Yep. Because you have to have eggs. Yeah, because if you're, if you're not fighting for social reasons, if there's not a hierarchy fighting, then it logically makes sense for the female to be bigger because bigger female means more babies. Yeah. You, ha- you can carry more eggs. Or, or larger babies. You, or you can larger. develop them more. Yep. It also means that, uh, again, a larger body collecting all those resources you need to have offspring. Mm-hmm. Whereas there are tons of examples where the males are just these little things whose whole purpose as goes uh, sexual interaction is survive 
just enough to go find yeah. a female. So survive until after yeah. you mate with a female. And then, hey, whatever happens after that is gravy. And sure. Which is why you can get some of these extreme examples of anglerfish mm-hmm. or uh, that parasitic barnacle. Yep, yep, yep. Where the male is essentially a little attachment mm-hmm. for the female. Or in the case, very famously, of some spiders and say spiders, praying mantises. Where they are, it is almost expected that they are going to be the first meal after mating right. for the female. Because a female, it takes a lot. You need space, you need energy, you need resources to be a factory for making more of your yeah, species. For being the source of life. So uh, oftentimes with females, that ends up being, and then of course, there's also the point to be made that uh, your being larger makes you safer. Yeah. So if you're the one securing the future of your species, then yeah, being bigger might offer a bit more protection. So there's a there's all sorts of reasons. And when we see the species where the males are typically bigger, often. They are taking on some of those responsibilities. Yes. They are now the source of protection. They are now the ones securing the ideal nesting, you know, or, or, or birthing territory and habitat. Oftentimes, they're also the one helping bring food and stuff. So, like, oh yeah, they, instead of the female just being a big bruiser who can do everything on their own, the male gets big to compete with other males and takes on some of that work. Yeah, either protecting the females and the the children, the, the mm-hmm. offspring directly, or securing that area, the, uh, the ideal pond or the ideal right. Chunk or of this forest. is my pride mm-hmm. of lions, and I'm the guardian while the females are taking care of basically everything else. Yep. So it it varies depending on the needs of that group, but the general trend is that that male size different, the males being bigger, is Typically, not always, not exclusively, but that's very much a mammal thing. Very to do. mammal, very social animal thing. Mm-hmm. And when you take in the grand scheme of the animal kingdom, kind of more an anomaly than the the trend. But it seems normal to us because we are mammals. We, we are mammals, and we are one of those where, on average. The male build is a little bit more yeah. robust. And we live in a mammal-dominated world yep. where most of our experiences, we're learning from mammals. And if we're honest, a male-dominated <laughs> world yeah, yeah, where... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, it sure is cool that the males are bigger. <laughs> well, it's male-dominated in the sense that most of the biggest animals in the world today yep. are males. And also that, yes, that is sort of the experience we're drawing yeah. on in our male dominated fields of science. Well, Cause I, I can remember it's... being a little kid when I, I'd find out that the biggest, coolest snake was the female and go, Oh, yeah. I can't, you know, I, I can't be that snake now. Yeah. So, Who's going to relate to that? Yeah. It's, yeah. So it's, you know, there's, there's another a, a societal aspect to why it seems unusual. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent question, Don. Thank you for asking that. Thanks to all of our patrons. Thanks to our requesters. Yes. Thanks to everyone who supports the podcast. Check out the blog post. We'll have links and pictures. And I have a few videos that I found that are real fun. Who oh boy. And tune in for our next episode in a fortnight. If you have questions, if you have things to say, get in contact with us in all the usual ways. And until then, we will see you next time. I said that sentence slowly while I saw if I could think of a tusk related pun mm-hmm. and i did not yeah i know i i also was trying to think of I one th- while you said I th- it slowly i thought i'd take a stab at it eh, eh. i hope you were all able to sink your teeth into mm. this episode mm. yeah no eh, that's no. that's it that'd be for the I fangs hate, episode i hate that almost as much as narwhal does yeah <laughs> play the outro music <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.